Welcome to another episode of the Federal Newswire Lunch Hour Podcast with your host, Andrew Langer. Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Lunch Hour with Federal Newswire. I am your host, Andrew Langer. And if you're tuning in on video, if you want to listen to us, you can catch us on all major podcast platforms, uh, uh, We've got uh, Amazon Music, we've got Spotify, we've got Apple Podcasts. And if you're listening to us, and we appreciate it if you do, you can also watch us on YouTube. Just go check out the Federal Newswire's channel on YouTube. Uh, Very excited. Joining me today is our guest. His name is Mike Benz. He is the executive director of the Foundation for Freedom Online. We're going to talk about what that is. He's a former State Department official, which is uh, fantastic. Uh, let's, but let's start there. What is the Foundation for Freedom Online? So our mission is to restore the golden age of the internet, the free and open internet that existed yeah. really from the time the internet was privatized in 1991 up until these sort of geopolitical earthquakes of 2016, uh, which ushered in an age of, uh, of censorship and of fundamental changes to the social contract that existed where people used to be able to have an information democracy and information meritocracy right. online, um, there was a sort of whole of society effort to implement uh, domestic censorship that uh, that what FFO, my foundation, does is essentially uh, is, is spearheading a, an attempt to, to educate policymakers, members of the public about uh, how the censorship industry dynamics work. Um, and what sorts of uh, things can be done uh, uh, in the interest of freedom. Oh, listen, I was a, a golden age internet user. I think you and I may be roughly the same age, but I I, um, I was on this thing called Usenet or Usenet, depending on how you want to pronounce it, which was all, well, I mean, there was imagery, but a, a lot of debates going on, a lot of political debates. I was an avid poster in in a, in a number of, uh, of issues, especially having to do with environment and environmental policy, which is a great passion of mine, and presenting that free market limited government uh uh, instance. And what I appreciated about it is that there, and I certainly appreciate more today, is that there was no censorship, that I could go and talk about the issues that I was talking about. And we would get into great arguments. And sometimes I wish that someone would step in there if someone said something that was frankly uh, untrue. I'd, you know, I'd love a little content moderation, you know. But on the other hand, there was merit to to what was going on there. This is what we're talking about here in, in terms of that golden age, isn't it? That's exactly right. Yeah. You know, you had a, uh, you had basically this we're living in what is sort of the revenge of the gatekeepers if yes. you will you know there was this sort of discourse without bumper cars that existed on the internet both pre-social media at the time of blogs and forums yes. uh, and then as social as social media led to a sort of centralization of platforms and everyone talking mm. on the same uh, on the being able to talk to each other really because they all shared the same platforms um, in both cases you had sort of this growing maturity of an independent media news and influencer ecosystem that came by 2016 to be able to approximate the reach of the New York Times or CNN. And what you saw was this sort of joint pushback um, to try to stop uh, independent media or independent voices from being able to have Mm. a dispositive impact on our political and social ecosystems. So so it's interesting right because there's a lot of there's a lot of issues that are at play. At the same time this was happening we also had the the rise of the paywalls. Mm-hmm. It's interesting right because you have the decline of the traditional newspaper business and consolidation going on lots of reporters being laid off and and the proliferation of independent journalists and independent journalism at the same time that a lot of out, and, and it's increasing number of outlets are putting themselves behind paywalls here so that you can't get access to that information. And I understand people have got to have a business and we've got to have a business model here. But talk about that dynamic and how that all plays together. Sure. So what you had really after the events of Brexit and the Trump election in 2016 is you had this sort of dual threat that traditional legacy news media faced. On the one hand, they were, they were losing you know, basically impact and the ability to be ag- agenda setters at the political level. But then they were also losing on the revenue side because of free content, the proliferation of of alternative sources of news that didn't require you to, and often the New York Times and CNN and, and whatnot were not the first broadcasters sure. of news. The citizen journalists who were there at the scene or who had some insider scoop because they knew someone who knew someone right. would beat them to the story. So what you had was the implementation of a number of changes to turn the knobs of volume down on news media competition and to force a captured market 
to redirect eyeballs back right. to traditional media. So there were actually partnerships that were set up in early 2017. Uh, one of them was called the Trust Project. Another one was Google's Owl Project uh, for so-called authoritative news. It mm. would be amplified, would be sort of super escalated up the up the search recommendation right. algorithms. So if you look, for example, uh, on uh, if you go back in, in the Wayback Machine and you look at oh, YouTube yeah. from pre pre 2017, and Pretty much anything you search for, you're going to see search recommendations that have a wide range of sure. sourcing for them. And then what you're going to see is starting in late 2017, almost all uh, almost all search results are going to have pinned to the top of it a source from CNN or MSNBC sure. or the Washington Post. Uh, you're, you're going to have a so-called authoritative source. It's basically the news cartel sure. that existed during the gatekeeper era getting a, you know, getting basically favors from the big tech companies to outperform artificially uh, alternative sources of news. So it's interesting because I, I, I just had a conversation with somebody about this uh, from a more centrist think tank perspective. And and they are obviously arguing on, on the lighter touch issue and and talking about the issue of platform and platform competition, which, you know, our brethren in the free market limited government community, that's their, that's their answer, right, is a greater competition. And one of the things that I pushed back on was the issue of not knowing. Right, if the consumer doesn't know that their news is being curated, and I hate that word, right. but if their news is being curated from a particular perspective, how can they really know that there's competition? And, and I want you to comment on this, it gets even worse than they're, when they're told that it isn't being curated or it isn't being sort of slanted from a perspective, so they're getting gaslit. Am I am I right? Sort of that this is this is where this is sort of the dichotomy here that's at work. Not only are you right, but there are levels of scandal to this that I find to be uh, fairly shocking and that that need a higher level of publicity. So, for example, Andy O'Connell was uh, a former senior executive at Facebook, yeah. rotating to Facebook um, after the 2016 election. Former uh, Obama State Department, Obama White House uh, guy. Um, he did a. a he was part of a panel discussion at Stanford in 2019. Um, it was a multi-stakeholder panel about what to do about um, content moderation. We, we need to uh, – uh, you know, there was this sort of heavy-handed uh, uh, early censorship work from 2017 to 2019 – but, but a lot of it was getting pushback in the population. They were concerned about something they called the martyr effect. Yes. Which is what happens when you censor or you curate somebody sure. out of – existence yeah. essentially out of search or the platform yes. right or even when you bury them you know yes. th there was a there was a time where there was a wide range of political viewpoints who would be who represented by the top 10 search results on Google or YouTube or uh, or in Facebook feeds and they were concerned about the martyr effect which would which is when someone perceives they're being censored right. and then develop a greater affinity you know the censorship sort of backfires and what Andy O'Connell's uh, basically colleague at, at Facebook said in that Stanford uh, meeting was that they needed to pursue mo more, quote, nuanced and covert methods mm. for being able to do content moderation to avoid the martyr effect. And you also started to see DARPA grant money flowing to this exact That's purpose. That's interesting, yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, there was um, uh, there's an academic, I believe he's at George Washington, Neil Johnson, who's, uh, who's published uh, a number of DARPA-funded studies on different kinds of censorship techniques to avoid the martyr effect. So, for example, the traditional type of censorship in the early iteration in 2017 was sort of top down. You know, you would, if there's an influencer that who you want to ban or a news in institution you want to ban from Facebook or you want to get deplatformed from ads via NewsGuard or another entity, they would just go for the top. They would just nuke that account, yeah. and they found there's a tremendous amount of blowback. So they proposed bottom up methods yeah. where rather than Rather than burying the individual, you bury a proportion of their followers mm. or their top amplifiers. They also had a technique called random partial, where it would it would be random. You'd basically draw a topographical map. Sorry, I can. No, no, no. Go ahead. No, keep talking. I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm formulating questions, but go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know where you would basically draw a topographical map of a, of an online narrative or of an influencer's reach, and rather than say you know capping the accounts of you know the three or four top lieutenants, or of the bottom class, you would you would have a sort of random partial thirty five percent from a smattering of this and that, yeah. in order to prevent the perception and the knowledge by the actual users of the platforms that this was being done, um, and then so you know there's a science of censorship behind this, uh, which 
you know, really started out of uh, out of work that was done by the foreign policy establishment for counterinsurgency purposes abroad. Sure. You know, Listen, you, I, listen. You know, back in the in the Obama administration, they did something called Operation Choke Point, which was on the financial services side. Had a conversation with Gentry Collins from the Free Enterprise Chamber of Commerce about this. That came out of something that the the Bush administration had had done to try to defund terrorists. And you know, if you get at terrorist bank accounts, you get at their ability to process credit card payments, which they were doing to fund their operations. You could shut down terrorists. The Obama administration did this and turned it around the, against physical entities that they had an animus against. And anyway, this is this is the same kind of thing. We take a tool that we're using here and we're going to apply it politically. This is what you're saying. That's exactly right. Yeah. And what you see is almost a one for one transfer from foreign policy establishment domains who who were the sort of originators of the technology or the promoters sure. of it for, for foreign policy purposes, then just transferring over to basically the civilian or the domestic facing arms. Like in this case, you had these DARPA grants to be able uh, back in 2014, 2015 to map the language of ISIS. Yes. You know, what kind of things were they saying to recruit people on Facebook sure. or Twitter? They used a tech, an, an AI technique called natural language processing, which just looks at the language that people use, hmm. the prefixes, the suffixes, the hashtags, you know, image databases. Um, and then you basically are able to uh, affix a score to any yeah. social media post. You know, uh, this is 85% likely to right. be a pro-ISIS recruiting statement. This is 25%. You can fine-tune those algorithms over time. You can onboard through tens of millions or sometimes billions of dollars in R&D funding. You can really fine-tune these things right. to be weapons grade. And what what you saw is basically <laughs> what what DARPA was doing uh, for for counterinsurgency, counterterrorism in 2014, 2015, is what the National Science Foundation sure. is doing for uh, uh, for basically conservative sentiment or COVID skepticism now. And the National Science Foundation is essentially the civilian arm, arm of DARPA. Wow. So, so, okay. so you have these these transfers from, from foreign to domestic, which, which I think, you know, we entrusted our national security state and our foreign policy establishment. We gave them tremendous powers sure. to be able to uh, defend and promote U.S. interests interna internationally right out the outset. Yes. The 1947 National Security Act. There was a, but there was always supposed to be a firewall. Sure. There was a Department of Dirty Tricks, and it was never supposed to come home. Um, and that social contract is now broken in in the current age of mass censorship and, and there needs to be strong and this is why support. we had a church commission in the 1970s to sort of go down that road and sort of peel it back on that thing and maybe you know what is old is new again right with FBI uh, the FBI getting involved in politics in the late 1960s now the FBI getting involved in politics once again 50 years later let me let me sort of go back because you're talking about this AI sort of attuned to the language of insurgency now being turned against Americans I, this explains why when someone said something very horrific and anti-Semitic to me on Facebook, and I screenshotted it and with the with the appended comment, which is not an uncommon comment on Facebook, you seem nice, uh, which is very sarcastic, right. and yet Facebook dinged my piece and didn't ding the original person. I mean, that's that's what it gets to. What I want to get into this, right, which is the issue of, of platforms and competition, and again, putting your thumb on the scale, um, because, you know, one of the problems, of course, is is the issue of not knowing, right? If you if you don't know that Facebook has its thumb on the scale, um, if you don't know that Twitter has its thumb on the scale, right? The shadow banning issue, which which I you and I know I think both agree that is a, is a real thing. We know it's a real thing, um, but if you don't know it and you're just sort of suspecting, you have no impetus to go to another another platform. Right. You just think this is the way it is, and I'm and I'm and I'm not and I'm not doing this. Was there a duty? Should there have been a duty on the part of these platforms? Is there an ongoing duty on the part of these? Assuming for a second that they have the right, and you, I think you and I are going to talk about this, assuming that a platform has the right to turn around and moderate content and promote X and not promote Y, if they have that right to do it, don't they then have a, a commensurate duty to inform everybody, hey, we're a leftist platform, you know, Twitter is a leftist platform, Facebook is a leftist platform, Meta, whatever it is. We we are gonna we're gonna promote X. You don't like what we're doing? You can go to Parlor or Rumble or wherever. They do they have that duty? Well, it's an it's a fascinating question. Thank you. On because because you know there's sort of the normative answer and the the legal answer. Um, yeah, the, right. The the two watchwords that that 
you know, the censorship industry, as I sort of refer to it, you know, uh, because it's this sort of multi-stakeholder model for building consensus for content moderation. Ah, decisions. consensus. And there are two watchwords from 2017 to 2020 were, were transparency and accountability. This <laughs> idea that, you know, uh, we need platform transparency about how populist, you know, political messaging is spreading on the platform, and then we need accountability uh, to, you know, basically, you know, punish them for, right. for allowing you know, at the time, you know, basically pro-Trump and even even some left-wing populist uh, uh, political issues, uh, Jeremy Corbyn in the UK, Bernie Sanders in his earlier iterations were also uh, targets of some of this. Yeah, before but, he molted. Right, and, and exactly, uh, right. And now and now he is uncensored, yes, essentially. Yeah. It's, uh, but, uh, but you had the... So transparency is one of these things where I think it is absolutely fair game if you're going to have... I mean, it's purely as a consumer protection issue, for oh. example. You know, we live in an era where you can't have a career in sales and marketing in this country unless you have a Facebook account, a Google account, sure. a YouTube account. LinkedIn. Yeah. Yes, you are cut out of the information age. Absolutely. And, and kicked back to the industrial age if you do not have access to these platforms. Um, the, there's This is not really something you can opt in and out, opt out of if you want to be a part of the modern era. Right. So uh, one of the things that that I think could be very easily done on the regulatory side if there was a sufficient uh, political coalition put together for it was to have the, uh, is to have transparency on the AI side so that you at least, if that is the policy, right. then, then at least you're able to go into the database and say, okay, these are the band, these are the keywords that will get you deamplified. Right. These will, not just the terms of service, which is where it's at now. Right. Like right now, um, you know, there are thorny issues around hate speech as, as you identified. Um, but it, it's way past that now. They're down to simple mis, dis, sure. and malinformation. And malinformation, by their own definition, the definition of the Department of Homeland Security, is true information that, taken on the whole, could mislead people. Listen, this is this is the conversation we just learned from. I think it was uh, it was uh, Massey, maybe I don't know who it was reporting. When we're recording this, we we just had the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. There was a briefing of senators, and you had a Democratic senator who I think uh, I now understand was Mark Kelly from Arizona right. going on there and saying, uh, "Yeah, how do we go about and censor?" Correct information about the financial services industry, but we don't want to cause a panic. I mean, this is this is where this is what you're talking about in terms of malinformation. What's really funny about that is I actually replied to, to Thomas Massey's post on that with uh, actual citations to CISA. CISA is is the cybersecurity sub agency within the Department yeah. of Homeland Security who transitioned to cyber censorship yes. by by declaring misinformation to be a cyber attack on democratic institutions. Wow. So, so that's how they gained long arm jurisdiction over election discourse, over COVID discourse, over immigration, and and even according to their own June 2022 mis and disinformation subcommittee mi minutes, they proposed adding a new category for financial misinformation. Yeah. Um, so what Thomas Massey was referring to from that that Mark Kelly comment is actually basically an initiative already underway at the Department wow. of Homeland Security simply by declaring. The financial sector critical infrastructure. Sure. So misinformation about critical infrastructure is now a cyber attack on the That's critical astounding. infrastructure. So the cybersecurity agency can work with its its deputized disinformation flaggers to get your your opinion taken. So, off the uh, but the your opinion taken off the internet, uh, most likely about your money, right? I mean, this is the thing: your life savings, your assets. You want to go and step and protect your assets. They're going to prevent you from doing that by by preventing you speaking and making right. You know, it's it's. Not that I want to get too far afield. This is this is where you get the criticism of Peter Thiel being able to look at you know what's going on with Silicon Valley Bank, seeing the writing on the wall, pulling his money out. You know, it they they want to prevent that from happening, don't right. they? Right. Well, yeah. they want to be able to um, to not have. I mean, in their own words, when they talk about this in the national security context, they talk about the destabilizing effects sure. of uh, of too much democracy. Essentially, is what they. I mean, it's just, in so many words. I mean, they say it's pro democracy, but really, it's they're not defending democracy. They're defending their own policy and pecuniary interests from democracy. That sure. Is from, yes. Uh, but you know, you see, for example, this in the COVID origins debate. Now, I don't weigh into that on substance. No, it's fine. The, uh, who knows what the what the right. real answer is? But the plain fact of the matter is, is you had a huge amount of government funded censorship of of online discourse about COVID origins. Sure, yes. You know, you had, you had Graphica, you, you had, you had Pentagon funded, State Department funded, NSF funded. 
you know, there were tens of millions of dollars poured into stopping sure. the viral spread of your opinions about, about COVID on a lab leak theory. No pun intended. To, <laughs> right. Yeah. But two weeks ago, Christopher Ray, the head of the FBI, now said, suggested that's the dominant theory okay. endorsed by the FBI. All right. So, so this is the, this is essentially the protection of, of noble lies, if you will. Not, sure. Not even we got to protect our phony baloney jobs, gentlemen. Right. The yes. idea is, is like, okay, Maybe you're right about something causing a bank run, but we need to be able to control opinions about it in order to – if you believe something, you need to wait until the government authorizes sure, you which to believe is, that. Which is exactly the opposite of what our system is supposed to be like. It's, it is um, – and I had a whole point that I was going to make about this. It, it uh, um, had a conversation a couple of weeks back here on the program with Stephen Meyer from a place called the Discovery Institute, which is a Northwest, uh, Pacific Northwest uh, uh, think tank. And you mentioned the issue of consensus and and what he was talking about is, and he's a scientist, he's got a PhD in physics and, and uh, a very respected scientist. And he's like, you know, anytime someone invokes the word consensus, what they're trying to do is they're trying to stifle debate. They're trying to silence debate. And that's anti-science, right? We're always talking about trust the science, trust the science. But if you can't have a vigorous debate about the science, it, having a vigorous debate about the science doesn't mean you don't trust the science. It means that we want to get to some measure of scientific truth, and they're trying to deny people that. In fact, the only way to actually trust the science is that the process right. has been respected. And this is one of the points that I keep hammering home about what's going on right now with government funding for the purpose of preserving trust in government. Give me a great yeah. example. The National Science Foundation uh, has this took this program from the Trump era called the Convergence Accelerator Program. Trump, in February 2019, set up this program to solve quantum technology. Problems. Yes. You know, these grand science home run challenges that required multidisciplinary, you know, the chemists have to talk to the physicists, have to talk to the rocket engineers, have to, you know, every, so funding this sort of ex convergence of scientists from different domains to accelerate one particular field of science. Yeah. So track A was quantum technology. The Biden administration gets into, gets into office. They inherit this, this giant sort of science accelerator program. They create a new track called Track F. It's called Trust and Authenticity. But the entire thing is for the science of censorship. They've poured $40 million wow. into – now, they declare in the, found, in, the, in the founding program documents – that the purpose of this is that mis and disinformation on the internet is causing a crisis in democracy. It's undermining trust in government sure. and trust in, in democratic institutions such as mainstream media. And so to restore that trust, they're, they're developing AI censorship techniques to tune down people who so, di who, who so, yeah. so uh, distrust or cast doubt on scientific consensuses. Yeah. Now, you've got a situation where they're essentially saying if trust cannot be earned, it must be installed. You know, and wow. and this idea that I mean, think about what what happened with the COVID origins case. How could you possibly, if your goal is to restore trust in the government, but the government banned you from from essentially funded your your deplatforming sure. on the basis of what you said, and then the government turns around and endorses that very belief All right. that they, you can't run a you can't advertise your flower shop sure. if you don't have access to Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, right. or whatever. People, I mean, the economic harm, the social harm, you lose your wedding photos if let you me, lose your Facebook let account. Me, let me ask you about this, because this gets, this gets, we've started to go down this road, and, and great conversation, I, I, um, if I do say so myself. But, you know, this issue of trust and social media deamplification, um, and part of what I was getting to was this. So, like, I had at one point, I was trying to, as I was trying to uh, promote the other, one of the other shows that I do. Uh, was spending money on Facebook to 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 do this, and I and I just was not getting any mm -hmm. any um, any bang for my buck, as right. it were. Despite the fact that I had X number of people who were tuning in, who were fans of my my show, or you know, part of my Facebook group. I, I guess my point is this. Now, I here's the problem: I can't prove that my money was was squandered away by Facebook. I I can't prove that they that they didn't do what they said they were going to do. All I know is I spent X and I didn't get anything for it in terms of Y. Now, it could just be that nobody wants my product. That's probably what it is. But on the other hand, it could also be because I'm a conservative or a libertarian conservatarian, a free market limited government guy who talks about skepticism and wants to talk about these and ask these big questions. It could also be that they were turning me down. Isn't there, I mean, it's, Fraud is a, is a remedy, right? If I hire an advertising agency and they squander my money, I have recourse in the courts to sort of go down that road. 
I have no recourse as a, as a private citizen in these cases, right. do I? So uh, talk well, about that. Well, it's, you know, it's it's great that you, you mentioned that as well because some of the revelations, one of the one of the uh, fascinating contributions of the Twitter files to this has been these sort of hard, unimpeachable, unimpeachable evidence in screenshots, for right. example, of of Twitter accounts of high profile uh, accounts who were who various classifier labels were given to them in the back end. You know, they showed accounts like James O'Keefe and Charlie Kirk, yeah. and the screenshots from the Twitter file show do not amplify. Yes, you know, th- basically all sorts of what they call friction. You know, friction is this. You know, basically every social media company uses this sort of tripartite tier system for for how to censor the information. They call it remove, reduce, inform. Yes. Remove is a ban, inform is a fact check label, uh, and reduce is is where a lot of the magic is. Right. All sorts of friction techniques. Friction is a word for slowing down the virality. You know, so that's everything from search bans, recommendation bans, shadow bans, uh, interstitials, uh, click-throughs, and and, uh, and sort of viral circuit breakers so that, for example, you can your message can spread up to say ten thousand you know uh you know, to a, to a reach of say you know uh, ten thousand impressions. Sure. At that point, it will hit a virality circuit breaker. They call it, and it will it will not wow. you won't be able to to basically get shares beyond that, or it'll sure. be, it'll be shadow banned after a certain minimal amount. And and you on uh, from the content creation side will only see that as a as a weird little plateau that right. seems seems seems. seems this is at. this is why when I would post something substantive on Twitter about regulatory issues or what have you, I wouldn't get many impressions. I post something about Scott Bayo, and all of a sudden I got thirteen thousand impressions on, on this because it's completely innocuous. Um, let me ask you this because I asked this question of somebody else, and they think that it's a glitch. This issue of on Twitter, I, I'm going to ask you this. I don't know if you have any answer to this. This issue of if I lock my account, my tweets get greater amplification over whether or not my Twitter account is open. And I certainly noticed that. I know I locked down my account for a couple of days and my tweets got amplified to my my followers once I opened it back up because I felt, you know, I'm doing these all this stuff. I want new followers, but I then my it it it, it dropped precipitously. Have any do you have any insight into, into why your lockdown account might uh might have greater amplification on tweets? Uh, I mean, I can only speculate, which is which is that, and it's one of the fascinating things about this as well is that, you know, Elon Musk doesn't seem to, and he actually posted about this, that there were so many trust and safety layers yeah. added to, you know, the, the distribution algorithms that Twitter has that even Musk, especially with the scaled down engineering yeah. team, doesn't yet fully understand how the model has sure. been evolved over time. I could see a situation, for example, where somebody, after locking down their account, it might trigger something on Twitter's back end to say, okay, this is going to cause some sort of reset on the classifiers. This may, you know, like, for example, if you deactivate and reactivate, it may actually, uh, you know, some of those, some of the tags that follow Or if there's account, a, a friction, right, where they say, all right, this stuff is not going to get amplified publicly, you know, to the general public. It's just going to the folks who choose to follow this guy. So we, 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 don't, we don't have a problem with him as long as he's not trying to get more followers or amplify it beyond the folks who are already following. Right. And what yeah. we do know is that there has been a hugely robust, um, uh, sophisticated ecosystem of political narratives right. that are tagged on the basis of this. So, like, so one of the things that my foundation has covered is both on COVID and on election discourse for the 2020 election and 2022 midterms. You know, there was this uh, hashtags, uh, branding terms, uh, specific uh, events, uh, and um, it, at both at the state level and the national level were programmed into the AI to be able to detect the associated keywords right. and then automatically tune down basically pro, you know, the pro side of that equation uh, to you know, to turn down the knobs so that they couldn't make political impact. So if I, so, so when I would uh, uh, tag something, hashtag CPAC or hashtag mm-hmm. something else, I'm doing my tweets a disservice, aren't I? Yeah, you are. Yes, you're making yeah. it easy to, for that to be detected. That's, I mean, it, it, it is one of those, oh my God. I mean, it, it, it really is, really is astounding to me. You were just testifying up on Capitol Hill, I understand? Uh, I was, um, or part I was of assisting, meeting? I was okay. assisting with the, with the, um, you know, the, the background understanding so that, Folks on, on all sides were able to have a, a sort of educated, 
you know, uh, glimpse into into some of these background issues. We're you know, about. let's talk about something else. I want to shift gears for a minute because we talk again. We have our friends in the the free market, limited government space who are very concerned about even a light touch in terms of regulation issues having to do with Section Two Thirty and the Communications Decency Act, all of those things, or the Telecommunications Act. Um, again, talking about competition because they think competition is the answer to everything, and I think competition has its place in in all of this. But then when you get, we talk about back ends, you need somebody to actually have the, the, the delivery space, the bandwidth space. And when you have a limited number of actors who are willing to provide the servers for and the server capacity for this, talk a little bit about, about that problem here in terms yeah. of competition solving this problem. Sure. So, I mean, that's well, what, what you just identified is, for example, what the famous example of Parler. Absolutely. Um, you know, after the 2020 election um, where you had an alternative – social media platform that was basically banned from competition because of gatekeepers up the stack. Sure. You, know, you had their payment processors cut off. You had you had Amazon Web Services cut off their ability to actually use cloud. But there's an, there's another aspect of this that, uh, again, my response to, you know, some of the legacy sort of free, and I also come from that sort no, of, of course, know, conservatarian yeah. sort of, you know, uh, th but you know, these are every single one of the major tech uh, platforms that exist today are government contractors. Yes. They are all subs. I mean, you know, Google's got CIA contracts, DOD contracts. You know, you've got you've got this uh, huge interrelationship with Facebook and the U.S. State sure. Department for our, our, our foreign policy operations abroad. Um, you know, you had the same thing with Twitter all the way back in right. 2007 to 2009. They were part of the Office of Policy Coordinations, you know, operations in dozens of countries. Uh, same thing with, with YouTube. Uh, and and then even at the at the infrastructure level, you know, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, all of the, you know, Amazon is a ten billion dollar you know cloud contract with the CIA. There, there's there is a leg up that that the the entrenched big tech companies have that you cannot compete with in in a fair market free market way because these are federal government subsidized big sure. businesses, and um, you know, f frankly, you know. I think until the the nexus between big tech and big government is is parsed out, um, talking about this and treating it like this is a uh, you know this is an, a lemonade stand and you're, sure. you just open up a competing lemonade stand, um, it misses something totally fundamental about about you know the, it, it's this interesting industry. because it gets down to I, and one of my great criticisms and again I consider myself a conservatarian I've got very good friends in the both well we're really in the small L libertarian movement. But there's always been this naivete amongst our friends in the small L libertarian movement about how the real world works and whether or not is how it works in terms of borders or how it works in terms of foreign policy and that there are bad guys out there who actually want to kill us or in terms of the relationship and how, you know, right? I mean, a good example for everybody the debate over drug reimportation, which I know is not your, your area of expertise, but the idea that we are going to somehow take the bad free market decisions of other nations who want to engage in price controls and we're going to use that as some mechanism of competition and that's somehow the free market. It's not the way it works and yet we had friends in the libertarian movement who were saying that it was – Talk about this naivete a little bit. And it, because, by the way, uh, we didn't really talk about it, but you are a, a State Department alumnus. You, uh, what, what did you do for the State Department? Talk sure. a little bit about uh, about about the naivete there. So I was what's known as a DAS, a Deputy yeah. Assistant Secretary. I was the DAS. I was the, I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Communications and Information Technology, yeah. which is a long way of saying I ran the the big tech portfolio Got for it. the State Department in the Economic Bureau. So, um, so I basically had three divisions under me. One was on security, yeah. you know, defending, you know, IT as it relates to low Earth satellites and SpaceX and subsea cables and and fiber optics. And then you've got you uh, the sort of bilateral. So our U.S. tech policy vis-a-vis -vis countries on a one-off basis. What is our tech policy vis-a-vis -vis Huawei and China, vis-a-vis yeah. -vis the EU? And then the third division was multilateral affairs, which is basically the private sector, the U.S. national champions on right. tech. And this is where I ran into. The Google lobbyists, yes. and the, the you know, Facebook, and the sort of big tech consortium there, and the nexus between big government and big tech. I was there uh, basically towards the end of 2020, uh, principally, where it was this period of intense consolidation between big government and big tech at a moment when big tech had 
basically severed the final uh, vestiges of, of the social contract that had existed uh, since the early 90s. Sure. You know, these were neutral platforms from the day they were yeah. born up until basically the 2016 election, yeah. when in lockstep, each of them moved uh, to take that incredible market power that right. they that had vested in them uh, from them winning the competition, you know, a joke I like to say is, you know, if we'd known Google was going to do this after 2016, we would we would have all been using Ask Jeeves sure, yes. in, in yeah, 1995 yes, or, yes, or Lycos. Right. Yes. You know, we wouldn't have given them all this market power if they knew they were going to use it. You know, it's like saying but that's the that's the danger, right? I mean, you, you let something grows that big, and and eventually, yes, it's going to right. You know. But there was look, I I'm a foreign policy realist on yeah. these things. I it's a big bad world out there. I'm not even. You know, I, I don't weigh into the substantive, you know, foreign policy thing on, on the grounds of saying we shouldn't have, you know, a, a full-throated, aggressive, maximalist foreign policy on these things. But when big government did favors for big oil, when, when we treat, you know, ExxonMobil and Chevron as U.S. national champions in the oil space, it, at least in that case, you don't get cut off at the pump. Right. You know, that is still, you could argue, in the U.S. national interest because the the beneficiaries are are lower gas prices. If if, right, if, if you went to the for, gas station and you couldn't pump your gas because you voted for Harry Truman, right? You know, God forbid we institute a, a, a Chinese style AI driven social crediting policy, and all of a sudden you can. You have that happen. We are now. We're no longer even in the infancy stages of that. We are in the adolescence. Uh, hold on. By the way, I'm not a conspiracy theorist to an extent. I mean, everybody, everybody is, but I'm. I you know, but nevertheless, you have to think about these things. So go ahead. I'm sorry. So, in fact, much of it is government funded. So, one classic example right off the bat that's been in the news a lot lately is a company called NewsGuard. Okay. NewsGuard is a, you know, it's it was basically you know, created in November 2017 as an attempt to try to bankrupt the industry of so-called fake news. Ah. You, know, you had these you had this New York Times, CNN, Washington Post, MSNBC, BBC, Reuters, AP sort of news phalanx. Yes. Dealing with the exact issues at the beginning sure. of the segment we discussed, and they came up with a basically a plan in tandem with allies in the national security state. On their board, by the way, right. is is uh, Rick Stengel, who runs the global engagements, ran the global engagements at the State Department. Uh, general Michael V. Hayden, former CIA sure. NSA four, uh, head and four star general. Anders Fogh Rasmussen, the former head of NATO. Uh, uh, Tom Ridge, the former head of DHS. It's a who's who of of media institutions on the one hand and top brass of the national and, security and the other. Yeah. And, what, and their purpose, what they created and what they've successfully implemented is a news ranking system for news credibility that they run through advertiser networks to, to get the social media companies to deplatform news institutions wow. so that there's no click-through traffic to their sites and then to get them banned from Google Ads and all of the major ad distribution platforms. They, this is how they basically contained the, the, the independent news revolution that was budding up until 2017. NewsGuard, the Trust Project, there's a dozen of these companies. They, and by the way, and at the, the, same, time, and the same time, there has been a concerted effort on the part of the journalism field to move away from objective journalism to advocacy journalism. Exactly. Got it. It's both sidesism is what they call it. You know that that they need to abandon the objectivity uh, principle because uh, both sides, you know, lead to demagogues, you know, being able right. to have. Right. So, you know, they, they come up with their, their copes and rationalizations, but at the end of the day, it's the creation of a protected news cartel right. by, because you, you, just like in the example of a big tech company, it's not like you can just create a, a, a lemonade stand and, and out compete on the basis of better lemonade. You know, they're getting their sales, not from, you know, the people on your street corner, they're getting their sales from the Department of Defense, Department of State, USAID. You have a similar thing now happening in the news industry, where if you want to create a competing news institution to CNN, well, guess what? CNN's got NewsGuard on their back. They're going to have you debanked, deplatformed. Sure. You're not going to be able to have a YouTube, a YouTube account, a Facebook account. You know, now you can finally potentially have a Twitter account, but you're not going to be able to monetize through right. ads on your site. You you are you're entering the Coliseum of the free market with one hand tied behind your back sure. and both of your legs cut off. That's that is astounding. So let's let's pull it pull it back a little bit here, Michael, uh, as we as we wind this down. Um, you worked at the State Department. How did you get involved in all this? How, how, where was sort of t tell us a little bit about your your sort of your career journey here? Sure. So I became interested in this in August 2016 is when I first started 
writing a no but let's go even oh, further sure. back i mean let's i mean how did you get involved in all of that how did you start going down the road of international affairs and tech issues i mean go go even further back sure so you know i was i was a tech lawyer you know okay. before my time in government um, you know, I did a lot of uh, uh, tech uh, financing. Where'd you uh, grow up? Name. I grew up out in the sort of suburbs of Philadelphia, okay. the mainline area. Yeah. Um, Where'd you go to law school? I went to law school, UCLA, undergrad, UPenn. I wanted to be oh, an entertainment lawyer. Okay. At first. Entourage was very popular. Uh, when I know, I, was I get it. Up no, I, nothing you know, wrong with that. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, but then I, I, you know, wasn't really uh, in love with the. Listen, you know, the, I was an know. international relations major, Soviet studies major in college, and took a complete turn down the regulatory and public policy road. Anyway, so we all we all have that I issue. But I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Sure. So you know, I was sort of a competitive chess player as a kid, and I lived wow. through that era. When Deep Blue overtook Gary Kasparov, sure. so I was, I was, and I was sort of an early adopter of you know this sort of generation of kids who are using chess engines for to to analyze games rather than the traditional sort of you know uh, trying to do it analyze moves sure. yourselves. And I watched as sort of purists from the older generation uh, sort of poo pooed the use of AI and and then were basically disproven by reality in a quite extraordinary fashion. And then everybody started having to sure. do it. Uh, you know, when I was practicing law and sort of observing events in 2016, I, I came across uh, basically research and news documents around the use of AI for, for content moderation on the yeah. internet. And I saw the parallels between that and what I felt like I'd lived through as a kid in chess. And I tried to tell everybody I could, freedom on the internet is has this existential threat sure. to it right now because they are going to do... You know, for for chess analysis, what what Deep Blue and Fritz and Hydra and everything did to completely change the game in of of chess, they're going to do that, but with the stakes of Western civilization. Sure, you know, they're going to be able to look at any political narrative, any social belief. They're going to be able to draw a topographical map map of it. They're going to be able to say, you know, what your score is for any particular social media post. They're going to be able to transcribe your voice to, with speech to text, and the whole thing is going to be you know, almost like a nuclear weapon sort of thing where you will be able to, rather, you don't need a standing army of 100,000 sensors. Right. You can have one disinfo lab sure. at Stanford who's going to be able to just provide input to right. a computer like, scientist. It's like dumping a, a laser blaster into the Stone Age and in terms of the damage that it can do. So lo and behold, that's exactly yeah. what happened after the 2016 election. You had institutions like Google Jigsaw who basically took this DARPA-funded AI conversational AI that was used, again, in the counterterrorism, counterinsurgency realm. They started applying it domestically. I uh, started to get involved at that point more with uh, the sort of, you know, uh, uh, foreign policy, sort of, uh, you know, geopolitical side of things. Uh, and that basically led to, uh, you know, my, my time at the White House and then at the State Department uh, trying to deal with this at the institutional and policy level. Listen, I saw the movie Small Soldiers, right? I know what happens when you dump uh, uh, Defense Department microchips into into toys and what can happen there. They, uh, so I, 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 didn't, I didn't tease you with this because we got started a little late. Um, and everybody's heard this narrative before. I'm going to say it again to you, so you you can understand it. So I, um, when I was thinking about doing some new podcast content, I was toying around with the idea of doing a show called Outside Interests, where we talk to policy folks and political folks about stuff that has nothing to do with politics and policy, because I think it humanizes people. I think it's important for for folks to understand that people are not all about you know policy work or political work or what have you. So I'm going to ask you this. So beyond doing the the tech work, you, you, do you still play chess? What are some of your outside interests? Sure. So well, music is you know is a big part of my life as well. Is it? Um, yeah. So I, you know I used to um, play in a bunch of bands, and it was a you know it was always like a, a lifelong. What'd thing. you play? Piano principally. Okay. Wow. Um, but uh, you know it to me. Uh, a lot of the censorship space has this sort of dark dystopian overtone to it. Um, and I think it's important to remember what you are fighting for yes. and, and to have a sense of beauty that sort of guides um, some of the, the moral convictions. Sure, I do yes, believe that's course. important to maintain outside interests and, you know. Just had another conversation about that very issue about beauty and, and the, you know, the creation of things without any soul and, and why that's so, so destructive. I'm sorry, you were saying. Nope. Well, I think we're just like in the in the chess world where you had these AI chess engines that that changed how people interacted with the game. In fact, there there came to be this phenomenon called chess DJing, yes. which is where uh, you know a human would basically DJ four or five different chess engines. Okay. In the process of 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 creating a new chess line, 
We're actually seeing that right now with Chat GPT yeah, four of course. and OpenAI and Bard and all these different generative AI things. We're actually seeing you know, there, there was sort of a, a new. I didn't see what happened in the chess world as being sort of an attack on humans from a pure sense. I, it was opening up new lines sure. of possibility and beauty that the human eye couldn't see until it could basically DJ different engines to see it. We're now at the early stage of that revolution happening in the online content generation yeah. space. You know, what, what ChatGPT4 just opened up two days ago is the ability to draw something on a napkin and it auto-generate a website, uh, a music wow. video. A, you know, all this I stuff need to is, sign up for that, yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. And all of it is now coming to the fingertips of 300 million Americans who is the moment they get versed in it. This is going to open up new lines of beauty. It's going to open. It's going to change multi. It's going to change news because it's going to change multimedia. Uh, but we have to be guarded. We have to be guarded. But and also against you know, there's going to be stakeholder consensus meetings right. to try to control that. Sure. So that you know, for political purposes. One hundred percent. Let me. I mean, but I want to get back to the the music and and you know, favorite favorite piano player, favorite keyboardist. Do you have when, what's what are you what what's something you have to listen to every day? Oh, that's. Is there I, something you have to listen to every day? So you know, I um, I have a very strange relationship with how I I like digest music because I okay. I try to chunk things into sort of phases of life, I get that. and I try to almost like a you know like a sort of Jim Croce time in a bottle sure. sort of thing where where I like to actually put music into sort of bottles that I can open up. I get for it. inspiration. I for get certain it. periods of life. So you know, so you know, right now you know a lot of it is sort of. Almost fleet, you know, Fleetwood Mac classic rock sure. type stuff, and then you know a little bit of like sort of Afro chill beat. You know, there's there's, I I mean, there's a wide range of things. It, it sort Listen, of depends. You know, on something. The... Sometimes I'm in a Tony <laughs> Allen and Africa '70 mood, and sometimes I'm in a Joni Mitchell mood, and sometimes like this morning I got in my car was listening to Beastie Boys on the way in. I mean, it, it, you, you're right. I think you're absolutely right. You put it in little bottles, and you pull those bottles off the shelf. You know, at a, at a certain point, I love that. I love that metaphor. That's a a really great way of, of, of looking at it. One final thing, just because you asked and I can't yeah, help myself. No, please. You know, um, I, uh, you know, I sort of grew up, you know, being forced to take piano lessons at a conservatory, learning classical. And I'm glad that I had that background in retrospect, but it wasn't until I had a, a teacher who taught me basically how to be able to just listen to something on the radio and, and play what I love that I thought made me sort of fall in love with the creation right. of music. Because of the authenticity that you can bring when you put your own personal spin on an improvisation. And this is actually something I, I find fundamental to independent content creation on the internet, to what made the internet so beautiful in the first place. The authenticity, you know, when when you could break news by just creating a Facebook account, every citizen became a reporter sure, overnight. Yes. The news went from being an industry that you had to be a, a credential journalist sure. to you could, to now there's there's thirty thousand so you know journalists essentially in your hometown right who are, who are but and the reason that that took so much market share from legacy media is because there's an in, there's an authenticity to being who you are that people can see in how you tell right. the stories that you tell and there's something there's an existential attack on authentic production right now right. by essentially legacy institutions who who understand they can't compete with that, or at least not not at the economic scale. Like, for example, they need to right. pay wall things, you know, uh, uh, because they're competing with authentic sure. voices who can, you know, so so I, I feel a strong mission to try to protect that. You know, and again, had a conversation with somebody just about that, talking about architecture and brutalist architecture uh, and, and how we're creating things without soul, right? If you, there's always, I, I hope, maybe this is part of the problem, is that there's always going to be a difference, or I would hope there will always be a difference between, let's say, a piece of music that might be created by an AI or or a, 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 or and, and one that's created by a person or a piece of poetry that's created by an AI or, or created by a, a person. It's one of those things, man. I, I, um, I took piano lessons for maybe a year or two as a kid, and my parents didn't for it. I regret, I regret that I can't play an instrument. I love music. Um, so having these kinds of conversations, you know, I, as you can tell, I can, I light up even more uh, about those things. So, um, but I take that, I take that all very 
Seriously. Michael, how do folks find out more about the work that you do at the Foundation sure. for Freedom Online? We're at foundationforfreedomonline.com. That's all one word. And you can follow uh, my updates online on Twitter at, at Mike Benz Cyber. All Thank you word. so very much for joining us Thank today. Thank you so much. It was lovely. This has been another episode of the Lunch Hour with Federal Newswire. Check us out wherever fine podcasts are found. Or if you're listening, you can watch us on YouTube. Leave a review. Recommend us to your friends, your neighbors, your friends' neighbors, your neighbors' friends. I'm your host, Andrew Langer. Enjoy the rest of your lunch. This has been the Federal Newswire Lunch Hour Podcast, hosted by Andrew Langer. Check out the Federal Newswire's family of websites, as well as their social media stream 